Okay, so the last video we were talking about some neurotransmitters and how they act like drugs and I wonder if anyone knows what this drug is. Uh, oops, sorry, looks like I almost answered the question or what plant this is and what cash crop it is. And I think I'm going to leave that up for a discussion to see, um, move that one to a discussion. So I'm just going to move right along. Um, okay, so this is actually the last slide about neurotransmitters. Should have squoze that one into the last video lecture, but whatever. Uh, and so in the previous one, we were talking, the previous lecture, I was talking about um, some different neurotransmitters. You have GABA, endorphins, which is actually a group of them. You have dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, glutamate, and various ones. And then I suggested that the um, sort of prescription drugs and illicit drugs act in ways just like neurotransmitters, just like brain chemicals. And one of the ways, which we kind of have already seen in one of the drawings, is they block reuptake. So the key here is understanding that drugs either increase the availability, and remember, not the production, it's the availability. So it increases the amount of, of neurotransmitter in the synapses, or it decreases the amount of neurotransmitter in the synapses. And they can do that. They don't, that they don't increase the production of it, but they can do that by blocking the reuptake like we saw with cocaine and crack, right? That is in Prozac and Floxetine, that it blocks it so that it can't be recycled. It can mimic the neurotransmitter in cases like that. It actually, so it's like a pass key and it sits in the same lock that the regular, that the neurotransmitter would. So I think the examples here are like nicotine, um, acts like acetylcholine, and you may remember that acetylcholine is, was an arousal and an energy. So a lot of people talk about feeling drowsy, that when they need a pick-me-up, they, they smoke a cigarette because it acts like acetylcholine, or it can block it. So in some cases, it, in some cases it sits in the receptor site and prevents that neurotransmitter from working because, of, because it's, something, it's, it's like glue or something in the, in the lock. You can't stick your key in if, there's already, if the key is filled with glue or if the keyhole is filled with glue. And that would be an example of, um, of Chanix. So Chanix, which is a, a stop smoking aid, actually sits in the same receptor site that acetylcholine and nicotine would sit in so that the nicotine can't bind there. And instead it just kind of has to float around and not have any effect, right? It doesn't do anything. So drugs act just like neurotransmitters. Well, actually they act in one of three ways. Okay, so for the next couple minutes, I want to talk about another part of the neurological system known as the peripheral neuro neurological system or the ones on the edge, right? So you have the central and then you have the one on the periphery, the peripheral. Um, for our purposes, so, you know, basically what the afferent and efferent refer to is that you have some nerves that go out to the edges and then you have some nerves that go from the edges to the to the center. And I don't think that shows up in the in a quiz at all, um, any place. I want to, but I, I want to spend more time and it's more important that you understand the distinction between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. I mentioned this, I think, in a previous video earlier in the chapter. Um, it's, uh, but this is a really important, um, this is a re these are really important systems and they're going to come up later when we talk about other, uh, they're going to come up when we talk about stress and health, they're going to come up when we talk about disorders, um, all of those, well, actually all of them, but the sympathetic nervous system, and this is how I always remember it, is it feels sorry for you. Remember, it's about self-preservation and uh, surviving, right? The evolutionary psychology stuff, which would say that all of our behaviors are about protecting and preserving and passing on our genetic material to the next generation. So the sympathetic nervous system is about protecting you. And anything that will keep you safe, it will respond quickly to threats, even things that aren't really threats. But you see, your, your body doesn't know that. Your body doesn't know that the guy behind you honking isn't the same thing as a tiger chasing you on a savanna. So the sympathetic system is very, very fast. The parasympathetic system is much slower. And the two of them work together. They work in concert. One is about keeping you safe, and the other is about keeping you healthy. So when your sympathetic system kicks in, 
all of those things like healing and resting and digesting and ovulating and cellular repair and anti-aging, all of those things basically stop because we got to run fast to save you. Now is not the time for you to be ovulating. Now is not the time for you to be repairing your cells. Now is the time for you to get the heck out of here, right? So aging is really about the sympathetic system. Um, aging is about the parasympathetic system, the like the sympathetic system, um, because aging is a matter of your cells deteriorating. And the more stress you're under, the more your cells don't have the chance to repair. So parasympathetic, it is slow. Rest and digest. Sympathetic, get the heck out of here. It's fast. It's going to move quick. Okay. Um, this is a fun little image I found, uh, stole a few years ago. Um, and it's what's referred to as the somosensory cortex. And this is a strip of brain um, about, oh, I don't know, two thirds of the way back in your parietal lobe. It's not in your frontal lobe, right? This is your executive function. Oh, well, there it is right there, a little picture. The primary somosensory cortex. And it's effectively like two strips. You have one strip that sends messages out. And then you have another strip that's involved in receiving and processing messages. And this, I believe this is referred to as a map. I believe this is the somosensory map. And there's a certain amount of brain region that's dedicated to receiving. This is the sensory one. So this is the one that's about receiving the messages, sensing um, if someone is touching you or heat or sharp, right, or sensing pressure. So this is the sensory band. And the map is intended to illustrate the amount or the relative proportion of brain matter that's dedicated to receiving sensory information from certain body parts. And then this guy is named homunculus. That's right. So homunculus is a creation of if our hands were, if the size of our hands was relative to the amount of brain matter that we have to receive information from our hands. If all of our neuro, if all of our senses were evenly distributed around our body, this is how large our hands would be in comparison to other parts of the body. The same thing with his big lips and his big tongue, right? There's a lot of sensory, our, our lips and our hands are very sensitive. Our eyes, oh my gosh, our eyes are very sensitive too, right? So the, the notion here is that there are more senses in our hands relative to the space, to the size of our hands. Um, and that's what homunculus is an, illustrates here. But it's sort of fun to look at, you know, like how much region of our brain is related to the tongue. Well, you know, if you've ever bit your tongue, it, you can, you know, you swear you just bought, how, bought, bought, you just bit off half of it. It's a little bitty thing, right? Or your face, you get a little bitty scratch on your face, how much pimples really hurt and distract you. But if you get the same pimple on your, you know, on your back, you don't feel it like that because what's your back? Is your back even on here? It's this teeny tiny, your trunk, your hip, your foot. Um, but what I think is really fascinating about, is your back even on here? Oh, what I think is really fascinating about this somosensory is it suggests that these regions of the brain, so where, like, let's say where it has trunk and neck, those aren't like puzzle pieces. And if you just cut out that section of the brain, you know, that they're, they're these, what do they call them? Um, um, ooh, uh, nucleus, they're interconnected. These neurons are interwoven. You can't just pluck out neurons. Like it's not like a puzzle piece or a Legos that you can just take it out, but they're all kind of interconnected. And, and sometimes the signals can get crossed or misinterpreted. You know, a classic example of this one would be if we were in a classroom together, I would have my, I would have one of your classmates put like a certain number of fingers on the back, on your back and have you guess how many fingers they're putting on your back. 
have them do the same thing to your palm of your hand. You're going to get it right on the palm of your hand because there's more neurons, right, receiving. But you might get it confused on your back because there's just not as much information, right? But sometimes we might, it, well, that was where I was getting at, is the idea that they get kind of, that they get kind of confused. And I found this really intriguing. It's a little bit PG-13, I have to admit. Uh, no, it's probably R-rated. But one of the most common, most common sexual fetishes in our culture are feet fetishes. That people get turned on by feet, either having their feet touched or other, touching other people's feet. Look right over here, and you can see that your where your brain processes information from your toes is right next to where your brain processes information from your genitals. Is it possible that these are con that they get confused or you quote unquote you get your wires crossed, right? I mean, we know this is true with parts of your abdomen that you can feel a pain maybe here, but it's actually I don't know the word, I can't remember the word for it. But what, what's wrong might actually be somewhere else. And all these nerve endings sort of get confused. So I just thought that was pretty fascinating. Bonus question for an exam, his name is homoculus. Um, and there's another one, this is sensory homoculus. There's another one that is um, the motor homoculus, which isn't quite the same. I think I'm gonna stop right there because I'm getting really, I'm sure I'm at 10 minutes and should be able to finish this up in the next uh, video lecture.